Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and um, and get started. Um, again, thank everybody for coming on. Uh, I know this was a kind of a quick setup. Uh, obviously, things change um, rapidly, so we kind of wanted to wait to see if there was any additional information before we kind of got everybody together as we embark on uh, the fall gym season. So again, thank you to everybody uh, for taking the time out to join us. Um, I know there's some people on here uh, that I want to make sure that you are aware that are on here. Uh, Sarah Allen, who's our deputy director uh, from NCS, I believe is on. Uh, uh, Keisha Dotson, our D division director, um, is on. Um, I know uh, Karen Avisado, our division manager, um, is here. Um, uh, Chris Scales, emergency support and program manager, is also um, on board. If I missed anybody, uh, please uh, let me know from our staff. Um, I know our schedulers are all here also. Um, so I think we got everybody. Um, Jason will be helping us uh, run the meeting um, as part of our staff. So. Uh, welcome everybody. I appreciate that. Uh, I thank also John Chapman. I believe John, are you here from Fairfax County Public Schools? Um, and Bill Curran from FCPS. No, they're invited. Hopefully, they will be uh, will be on. Um, I'm here. I think, I think Bill's here. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Um, all right, so one of the things, some procedural things, if you do have questions that pop up or you want to enter, Jason, you want to explain to them the chat room, being able to put them in and then you'll be able to read them. Would you do that, please? Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, if you just want to put in the, the chat any questions that come up um, during the presentation that the health department has, um, any questions that were submitted beforehand have already gone to the health department, so they'll answer those. And then at the end of tonight, I'll go through the chat and then um, we'll answer any questions that have um, been left unanswered. And if there's not a answer tonight, we'll make sure to get back to you guys directly with a, a email follow up. Okay, thank, thank you, Jason. Appreciate that. Um, as of now, just as, as a basic rule of thumb in terms of our indoor usage, um, at this time right now, um, we are following the Fairfax County Public School indoor usage guidelines. And so the basic premise of that is that masks are required for everyone that is in the gym, except for those that are engaged in physical activity. So that means that coaches have to wear masks, spectators have to wear masks, players when they come out of the game on the bench have to wear masks. Okay, that is the policy that we are following at this time. OK, if things change, if we get updates, we will certainly pass those on. But that's the policy I spoke with community use today. Um, and uh, so that is the policy as it stands right now. We will be sending out a uh, FC. We will be spending out an indoor use guideline sheet um, and asking you to make sure that you sign the sheet and that you follow the mask requirement and that you notify and cooperate with the health department if there are any cases that are there. OK, so that's the basic premise of what our policy will follow. Um, and somebody asked about referees. I believe referees will be those that will be engaged in physical activity. So that if they're doing that, they're OK, but on the sideline. Um, OK, um, without further ado, I believe, Sean, I thought I saw you pop up um, from the health department, and I think Jason is ready um, to kind of go over the presentation um, and we will go from there. Sure, let me uh, pull up the PowerPoint real quick. Thanks, Jason. No problem. You guys are able to see that? I see it. OK, cool. OK, Jason, you want me to get started? Sure, whenever you're ready. Just uh, awesome. let me know when you go. Next slide. 
Yeah, of course. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Sorry I jumped on a couple minutes late. Um, it's been obviously fairly busy for the health department. But um, I, I, my name is Sean Kiernan. I am the epidemiology chief at the health department. I've been uh, part of the COVID response the, the almost the in, in, the in, in its entirety. Um, and and it, you, some of you might have seen me talk about similar topics in the past. Um, so, so I think this is not, nothing that I'm really expressing today is, is that new. I don't think it should come as a surprise, um, but I am hopefully able to touch on some of those hot spots or kind of those tricky areas. So you, so you guys understand where we're coming from in regards to kind of our control measures and what we're recommending for the upcoming season. So we can go next slide, Jason. Yeah, I always cut myself off. I always talk about exactly of what is on the next slide uh, too, too, too much in advance. But um, so, so I know um, these pre just a question that always pops up. These slides will be shared with you guys so you guys can review them. Um, it looks like this presentation was being recorded as well, so you guys can review the recording as well. Um, and like I said, the majority of this information is not new guidance. This is kind of the, how we've been approaching sports um, for the last, um, you know, 18 months during the pandemic. Um, and, and we want to be as transparent as possible with you guys. I know that helps a lot when you guys know where we're coming from and when it comes to these contact investigations, it really helps a lot. Just like you know, then you could express that to your parents and your coaches, and then no one's caught off guard when we're when we're doing these investigations. Next slide. Okay, um, the biggest thing is we we like FCPS and and kind of the big school districts. We absolutely recognize the importance of youth athletics, adult adult athletics in our community. Um, obviously, it has huge benefits both phys physically and mentally. Um, there is, um, you know, it's almost countless benefits. So we are huge promoters of that, um, but we're also huge promoters of doing this as safely as possible during a pandemic. We all want to get back to our normal lives, though the world that we live in right now is kind of forcing us to make adjustments in how we live. Um, and so we want to make this as safe of an environment as possible when it comes to your sports, especially as we move towards indoor sports um, in the upcoming months. Next slides. OK, wanted to show you guys kind of where we are at for case counts, um, where we think we're going to be headed as well. You could see um, di three different peaks pretty much. Um, the three different peaks we're showing um, are a peak right in the beginning of the pandemic. And then we had our highest peak in the winter of 2021. And unfortunately, we're starting to see increasing cases again. It's a slower. Um, slower incline of cases, but that's what we're seeing. So we're starting to see a, a gradual increase in cases as we're moving into higher transmission levels within our community. Next slide, please. Okay, um, a, a thing that's thrown around a lot, obviously, is what is our transmission level? What's our case de disease, current disease activity level? This is from last week, the data. Um, it's, it's probably right around the same point today if I ran the numbers, but we are considered high transmission in Fairfax County right now. Um, the thresholds are fairly low to get to high transmission, but we are in high transmission right now, which means that we have to be as, as strict as possible when it comes with our guidance. We really are trying to push as much of our guidance as possible. One of the things you're going to see, though, is a lot of our, our recommendations are just that, recommendations at this point. We're really relying on you, your leagues to, to try to really um, help us enable these recommendations to be put in place throughout your leagues. These are, these are public health recommendations. Our enforcement policy, I'll touch on it a little bit, but um, is, is much more decreased now that, that a lot of the, the executive orders have gone away. So these are, these are basically recommendations at this point, other than a few key things like reporting, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Next slide. And then obviously what you guys <laughs> and projections are um, a lot of times projections are are not as useful as we want them to be. But what what the, the current Delta variant, the UVA projection modeling for for COVID right now is showing a peak and you guys can review this whenever you want is showing a peak in late September, early October of cases in this area. These are Fairfax Fairfax projections. Um, so then we hope for another sharp decline once we hit that kind of level of Delta being spread as much as it possibly can in Fairfax County. 
Next slide, please. OK, um, you know, a lot of times one of the questions that popped up from from you all is, um, you know, why are you not targeting us? But, you know, why are we we really trying to push these presentations with certain groups? And, um, you know, just by the nature of sports, sports and athletics are going to obviously include close interactions with individuals while they're breathing heavily. That that is. Uh, a higher risk factor for COVID transmission. So, and we've seen that bear out in the numbers. So, so since um, October 1 of 2020, we've had 35 outbreaks in youth athletic groups, um, and we've had 173 cases amongst those outbreaks um, with an average number of contacts of almost 20 in sports. So you can just see a lot of times when we have a case amongst a team, um, an outbreak amongst a team, most of the team is exposed to COVID. Um, and youth athletes make youth athletics make up almost seven percent of all of our outbreaks in the Fairfax Health District. So you can kind of see the settings of where we're seeing outbreaks and athletics are are in the top five for settings for where we're seeing outbreaks. The the sports are wide and varied. Um, so we're seeing outbreaks in all these sports. And and I do want to mention, you know, a lot of these outbreaks um, are they're just you know there's social natures of these sports as well so a lot of friends play these sports together so you know we're seeing outbreaks amongst a team but those outbreaks can be traced back to not just sports activities but also social settings where kids are hanging out after practice we're trying to parse it out as much as possible but we do understand that there is a social nature obviously in sports and some of these outbreaks you know are are the the transmission is helped by Friends are playing sports together. They're also hanging out afterwards as well. It's really hard for us to parse that contact, obviously. Next slide, please. I, I already talked a little bit about this, but I do want to touch on it. You know, why is why are athletes at higher risk for spreading COVID-19? Um, you know, physical proximity, shared game equipment, uh, a cumulative length of time. So we, you know, our 15 minutes is kind of our guiding post for close contact to an exposed case. And during a basketball game, there's there's you know there's a lot of times where individuals are very close to each other, um, breathing on each other, heavy breathing, sweating on each other. So all you know, uh, just the, the activity of exercise itself um, makes transmission at, at a higher level, um, and all the science bears out from that. Um, indoor settings are are a higher risk. The reason for that is the air is not as easily dispersed. So those viral particles are going to stay in an indoor setting longer. They're not going to be able to spread out. They're going to stay in that setting for a little bit longer. Next slide, please. OK. So our recommendation on our approach to investigations whenever there is a case amongst the team is that the team lets us do an investigation. So we want to pause the, the team activities to allow the health department to do an investigation. The reason for that is 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 the safety of your players and coaches, right? We don't want individuals who are potentially infectious who should be quarantined playing in a sport with other players. Um, so that's that's our biggest recommendation um, is to try to really um, get in there, do the investigation as quickly as possible to limit the amount of of um, disruptions in your league. Um, and and allow us to make sure individuals who should not be practicing and playing in games are not practicing and playing in games. Um, one thing that um, you guys have tried to help us with in the past is actually doing the investigation. And and you know we've urged you that that's our responsibility solely because we have the legal role and responsibility to do that investigation. Um, you know a sports league cannot enforce a quarantine if they needed to. A health department obviously could. Um, in some circumstances, just by the nature of how many cases there are on a team, it won't make sense for you to practice. So there might be settings where you have four cases on a basketball team, the whole team is quarantined. So then just by the nature of no one's, you know, no one is able to play, then that team might be paused for 14 days. That's usually a decision that we come to together, or for the most part, honestly, it's, it's a decision you guys make because you say, what's the point? I can't practice with one player, so we might as well move on. Next slide, please. OK, so the things that obviously that you care about is wh who is required to report? What am I required to report? Um, what is the actual requirements versus recommendations from the health department? OK, so outbreaks are required to be reported to the health department. Two or more cases on a team are are legally required to be reported to the health department, 
A sports league falls under a daycare program. This is a, in in a, in the code of Virginia. Um, so this is a legally required reportable condition. So when we have two cases on a team, it is required to be reported to the health department. Um, we have requested that individual cases are reported to us as well. That's not a requirement, but we've requested that more so for your benefit. So we can do that investigation as quickly as possible and limit exposures. Next slide, please. Where do you report this? We have an online link for you to report it. Um, so you're going to pretty much let us know who is reported as a case in your league. So, you know, when someone calls the coach and says, I can't practice today, I have COVID, we're requesting that that information be passed through the league to a nice point of contact. And that individual would then fill out this, this survey, this HIPAA compliant secure survey. Um, all the data sits on the Virginia Department of Health servers. Obviously, we're able to access it at the Fairfax County Health Department. And that is information like who is the case. And this is where we're also requesting that you provide us rosters of teammates so that we can make our investigations as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. OK, so kind of just some more legalese, and I don't want to get too too parsed down into this. We covered this this six months ago. If there's anyone new in the audience, I definitely want to make sure that you're aware of it. Um, a lot of questions that came up for, for, from your guys' perspective is I can't share the information of my players to the health department. Um, it's 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 protected information, and and so the health department is is able to receive legally any information. If if a sports league shared us information in during the the process of a communicable disease investigation, there is no they are protected from all liability in that circumstance, especially when we direct direct you to that. Um, you also, sports leagues may voluntarily comply with contract tracing. Um, if we think a situation, so we always want you to comply with us voluntarily. Um, if we have a situation that we are very concerned with and leagues aren't working with us, um, then we can get um, orders from the health commissioner to get compliance and investigation. So if a league is not calling us back, there's multiple cases in the league, they're not, they're not providing us the information that we're requesting, we can pursue an order from the health commissioner. Again, we never wanted to get to that point. It's just these are the tools in our toolkit if we needed to use them. Next, next slide, please. OK, some kind of um, terminology I, I want you to make sure that everyone understands. Um, a quarantine. Um, the, the quarantine, the individual public health order, um, it's um, not voluntary. Um, this is an order for an individual to, to stay at home if they've been exposed to COVID. So these are well individuals who've been exposed to COVID. Um, we, we use, um, I know the CDC posts um, alternatives to quarantine recommendations. Currently in the Fairfax County Health Department, we use the 14 day quarantine period um, very clearly on the CDC and the Virginia Department of Health website, it states that 14 days is the preferred length of time for quarantine, and it is up to the local health department's discretion on what quarantine like they would like to mandate. In Fairfax, we, we implement the 14-day quarantine. Um, pausing or stopping of activities is, is hopefully much less time, and that would involve us um, pausing the team, so stopping all team activities just until we can finish our investigation. Um, so, so, so that we hope it would never hit a 14 day window. We hope this is done in a couple of days. Next slide, please. Okay, so what is our exposure definition? Again, um, the traditional exposure definition for COVID-19 in a sports setting is being within six feet of a person who has COVID-19 for a cumulative total 15 minutes or more over 24 hour period. That is the traditional one that we've kind of all heard and, and learned over this time period. Um, there is subsets of that exposure definition. Um, and, and we could see that if an individual, so, so now I'm seeing the questions pop up. Quarantine is triggered when you meet this exposure definition to a confirmed case. So another subset of this exposure definition is having a direct exposure um, to respiratory secretions from, from a person who has COVID-19. So this could be used in a setting. So if someone has very, very direct contact with another individual, I'm going to use the example of wrestling because it's the most easy example. 
they don't, and I could be wrong here, but I'm pretty sure wrestling um, matches don't last for 15 minutes from person to person. But that amount of exposure with each other when, when individuals are competing and wrestling, um, we're going to consider that an exposure every time just because the level of interaction, the level of direct physical interaction there. Um, we, we have not been using it. Um, you know, when someone runs by each other in soccer, we, we don't use it in that setting. We're not just trying to find ex more exposed individuals. We're pretty conservative when it comes to using that portion of the definition. Um, a sport where we might use it is, again, basketball. You know, a lot of, you know, uh, direct contact, you know, in the paint and all that kind of stuff where we try to parse out who's who's considered exposed in that setting. So our investigators are going to, to determine if someone is a close contact um, and then we are going to implement a quarantine on that individual. Next slide, please. OK. Obviously, a big question right now that's been different from the spring is what happens if you have if your players or coaches are fully vaccinated? Um, that means that that's great news. I, I think the big bullet here is vaccines equal less disruptions to leagues. Um, so exposed individuals. So if you're determined to be a contact to a confirmed case and you are fully vaccinated, as long as you are asymptomatic, you do not need to quarantine. You do not need to stop practicing. You do not need to stop playing. So fully vaccinated and asymptomatic individuals do not have any disruptions in their practices um, or playing. So that's great news for everyone who's fully vaccinated. That's why we wanna try to push vaccination as much as possible to really limit the disruptions in our leagues. Um, we, we did not make the policy, but you could see why FCPS would put forth the policy of requiring all of their athletes to to be vaccinated, fully vaccinated. Um, it, it is it is for less disruptions. That is the reason for it. Next slide, please. A lot of we I touched on this a little bit. Um, why do we use the 14 day guidance? Um, currently, we use that because we believe it is the most appropriate uh, um, response to trying to limit disease interaction. This is a very fancy and technical slide. I don't want to get into it too much. But the risk of someone, so, so one of the CDC recommendations is that you could use a quarantine of 10 days. That, in, that introduces a 5 to 10% risk that someone who should have been quarantined could be exposing other individuals while they're, while they're removed from, from quarantine at the 10-day mark instead of the 14-day mark. So that's really why we're doing it. We want to limit disease transmission as much as possible in our community. Next slide, please. Who are we working with? Um, you know, obviously NCS has, has graciously put this together. Um, we work very closely also with the Parks Authority. Um, Virginia Department of Health are, we're in ongoing discussions to try to better our improve our processes. We wanna make sure everything that we are recommending is in line with what they're recommending as well across the Commonwealth. Um, and then obviously also we wanna have some, some um, we don't want the school sports to be different from rec sports as well. So that's why we want to try to try to match our guidance as much as possible to them. Next slide, please. OK. I put this table together for you guys. I think this will help help um, you guys figure out what the current mass guidance is for all sports. I think this table answers a lot of the questions that we received pre pre the presentation tonight. So as I move along this table, um, hopefully it's it's clear of who is recommended for mass. Again, these are just recommendations, just like when you walk into a target and you see the recommendation for individuals to wear masks. Nothing here is required by any law. These are recommendations. Um, I would say, um, you know, I think all of you kind of realize though that you're introducing liability and kind of so, some some riskier situations on your league if things aren't enforced um, within your league. Um, or try to be enforced as much as possible. So, so we'll start with outdoor sports first. Um, so the recommendation is for fully vaccinated individuals. Um, no mask would be recommended for those individuals. Again, this is outdoors. Um, active players who are not um, fully vaccinated, masks are recommended if they cannot maintain social distancing and they're able to tolerate or safely wear it during the sporting event. So that's that's a personal decision a lot of times. That's a sports, it's gonna be dependent on sports obviously as well. Um, but, but if there's direct interaction between athletes, 
if someone can tolerate a mask, then it's recommended that they wear it. Um, for all non-active players um, who are fully vaccinated and not fully vaccinated, not fully vaccinated, a mask is always recommended. A mask is recommended at any setting where you can't maintain social distance. So spectators, um, anyone, referees, coaches, if they can't maintain that six feet of social distance, then a mask is recommended for that individual. Moving to indoor sports, active players, no mask is recommended for individuals playing indoor sports, sports who are fully vaccinated. Active players who are not fully vaccinated, again, it's recommended if they're able to tolerate it, safely wear it. I know for a fact, obviously, you know, basketball players in SCPS are not gonna wear masks when they're playing basketball. Um, so, so, you know, I think that's kind of the threshold. Can you, can you safely play a sport with, with a mask on? And if you can't, then, then, then active players are just not gonna wear it. That's the reality of the situation. And we understand that. Um, for everyone else who's not playing though, whether you're fully vaccinated or not fully vaccinated, a mask is recommended. So that is the guidance right now for pretty much any setting, right? Any setting where you're indoors right now, masks are recommended. So that's what we're gonna recommend as well, obviously. I'm gonna, I, Jason, I'm almost done with my slides. I think this is an important slide. Um, I, I'm gonna wait to see what kind of chats come up. I just saw one pop up. This does not, so that was a good question. Who, whoever answered that question, I'm sorry. The question was, so we have it, does this contradict what FCPS is saying about indoor, indoor kind of mask wearing rec recommendations? FCPS is not talking about sports there. So sports, um, when people play sports, different rules kind of, they shouldn't, but they apply to them. Um, so that's, that is the difference in that recommendation. Everyone else would be recommended to wear a mask, um, but you're gonna see where the reality of the situation is indoor sports, the active players are not gonna be wearing masks because of a safety or kind of a competitive kind of issue there. You know, you don't want people grabbing masks and all that kind of stuff off of active players. Hey, Sean. Can, yes. I, can I jump in for just jump in for a second, just to make it clear yes. that FCPS and I know the health department is recommending the FC, FCPS is requiring those that are not actively engaged in their activity to wear a mask inside. So yes. even though the health department, it's a recommendation, FCPS is requiring. So I think that may be a little of the confusion and just to make sure people understand that that if you're actively engaged, there's no mask that's required, but if you're in the building as a spectator, a coach sitting on the bench, FCPS is requiring that you have a mask on. Bill Curran, just to, if, if, I, if I missed something on that, please let me know. Thanks, Mark, that was helpful. Hey, Mark, this is Bill. No, you're, you're right on that. When you enter our buildings, the expectation is you wear a mask. Um, if you're engaged in physical activity, as Sean has said, it's the same. It's it, it's basically that same piece. If you're entering, if you're not engaged in physical activity, you know, um, you have to wear the mask. If you're in physical activity, you're playing basketball, you're playing volleyball, whatever the case may be, mask. Um, you don't have to have it. Otherwise, you have to have it on. Yep. Thank you. I didn't see any additional questions pop into the chat. So, Jason, you want to move forward? Sure. <clears throat> Uh, uh, Bill, we'll, we'll, I will answer your question right now. FCPS has put forth a policy. I don't want to speak for FCPS. Has put forth a policy to require vaccination for for athletes. Um, there's there's obviously a lot of questions about that policy, and I I don't think this presentation is about this, so I don't want to jump too much into it. There's lots of articles out there, and I think there's probably an FAQ out there on FCPS's side. So I would refer to that right now about that. Um, okay. Obviously, the, the masks aren't the only tool in our toolkit, though, right? Um, you know, I, I think there is other tools in our toolkit to make these sports as safe as possible. We don't want to stop these sports. We don't want to close these sports down ever. Um, you know, I think in short, the, the, the next most important one is if your coaches or, or you know, volunteers notice someone who is ill, um, you know, that screening is really, really important. We don't want ill individuals playing sports. When someone is actively ill, um, acutely ill with a virus or anything like that, um, 
they're most infectious right when their symptoms are starting to show. Um, so, so that's a big step there. So getting messaging out to your parents or your players saying, you know, we want to make this as safe as possible. Make sure if you're ill, you don't play. Go get tested. Go figure out what's going on with it. Now, ill is different than allergies. If someone has allergies in the, you know, in, in the fall because they have hay fever or whatever, that's different. We're talking about new symptoms, unexplained symptoms of illness, respiratory illness. Um, okay, social distance as much as possible. So really try to, when, especially when indoors, try, I, I, you know, it's tough, but practices need to be a little different. We'd want to try to maintain that social distance as much as possible during during the during the practice, especially during water breaks um, as well. Reduce shared equipment as much as possible as well. Have kids, you know, bring their own stuff in. Um, we don't want to share equipment um, too much during these sports just from the possibility of transmission there. Um, you know, what we found a lot, and I, and I alluded to this before, and this is, this is impossible for you guys to enforce. This is messaging that we need to get out, obviously. Um, but, you know, sports aren't the only reason that these people are together. They do things that they go to parties together. They do lots of things together. There's, there's get togethers for teams, that type of thing. We've seen cases from that type of, those types of exposure. So we want to discourage that as much as possible. And that's our messaging. You know, I, I don't think we, you know, the leagues have a certain responsibility to keep their league safe. Um, we need to put out messaging to ensure that everyone understands the, you know, the more people you interact with, the higher at risk you are of develop, get, getting COVID, unfortunately. Um, you know, anyone who's not essential visitors, um, you know, spectators, there is no, there is no require, there's no mandates on crowd sizes there. Um, but, you know, currently, yes, <laughs> um, John is saying there's no there's no mandate on on sizes. Code of Virginia did have that beforehand. The limits on the crowd sizes, there is no limits anymore. It's we just want to be as safe as possible. Right. That's that's what we're really trying to push out with as well. And then obviously, if you have questions specifically about your sport and, and if you're trying to think of outside the box strategies for those sports, please call us. We'll try to strategize with you. We'll try to brainstorm with you to try to make this as safe as possible for your leagues. Next slide. I have some up more and obviously again we're sharing these so these links will work when you get it. These are the recommendations. This is where pretty much all the material from the slides came from. Um, so you guys have references for all of you. Okay well so if she, next slide. Hold on to it. If, she, if there okay. was one in there. If they yeah, actually let me so we are um, at the question section right now. Um, Jason, is there any questions from pre that I, that I didn't touch upon that you want me to touch upon? I'm going through them right now. Hold on one sec. Uh, just to reiterate, while Jason's kind of looking through that, we will be sending a kind of a contract out um, in the next 24 hours that will basically talk about the mask requirements, everything we just talked about here, required for spectators, required for coaches, required for people not engaged in activities. And it will also have the link on it. And I think it's red cap, right? Sean, make sure I don't mispronounce that. And Chris Scales, you can help me with that. It will be on that actual form. And we're gonna ask you to sign that and get it back to us, that you understand the obligation that you have to follow these particular rules and to be able to report and then be able to um, help the health department when they do their investigation. That's that's the key. Chris, is that correct? That's correct. And I wanted to, um, before we get into the other questions, if, if I could get Sean just to, because this came up a couple of times last season and I, I saw a, a question early on um, about the actual process. So once uh, Sean, once Rick, once a Rick cap case is put in, can you kind of talk about the expectations? Because I saw some folks had put in uh, that they weren't contacted back directly. So I want to make sure that um, folks know the expectations and kind of what takes place once they do a case. Do, should they expect to hear back or is it just contact with the case? So if you could kind of go through that quickly, I think that would help folks a lot. Yeah, of course. So so your guys piece of information is the first piece of information that we need. Um, to, to get our investigation rolling. Um, 
it, so our next step is making sure that it truly is a positive case. We don't want you guys reviewing lab results and all that kind of stuff. We don't want you putting in a spot that's not, a, you know, that would make you uncomfortable. So we're going to try to figure out to make sure that that person truly is a case of COVID-19. Um, we are trying, um, once we confirm it's a case, it's our responsibility to do the case investigation. If we can get the information that we need from the case, um, so if they're a reliable um, historian and they can tell us who they're exposed to in the sports setting, we might not need to contact you guys to help with the investigation. We might just have all the information because you provided us a roster and phone numbers and we're able to quarantine who we need to quarantine and that's it. The follow-up piece, we try our hardest to make sure we circle back with you guys to tell you our investigation is done. We told everyone that we need to who is quarantined. I will tell you though, during peak of disease transmission, when we are really stretched thin, that is put on a lower priority for us. We know we want to do it. We know it's best practice, but unfortunately, just sometimes there isn't enough time in the day. Right now, we have about 200 staff members in Fairfax County doing all sorts of obviously COVID investigations, and we are very, very busy every day with an average of 150 cases and the complexities of those investigations. So, Long way of saying we try to reach back out to tell you when the investigation is done. We 100% will reach out if we need your assistance in that investigation. Um, our practice is to reach back out, but sometimes that might not happen. But don't worry, we have received it, the Red Cap survey. Thank you. All right, and I just will scroll to the top. Um, question, just confirming no mask while playing, is that correct? That is correct. Yep. yep. Will we get copies of the slides? Yep, the slides will be emailed um, out after the meeting. Uh, I think I heard parents and spectators will be allowed into the school and the gym. That's correct. All right. Yes. Uh, have been given multiple numbers to call to report a case, which is correct. And what about callbacks for larger multi-sport organizations? I think you guys kind of touched on that. Yes, yeah, there a specific right number? We're definitely pushing the red cap survey for reporting. Um, it's just easy for us to co consolidate all the information in there. Um, if we don't, if you really want to call, our call center number is the best line, and I'll share that. I honestly, I don't even remember it off the top of my head, but I'll share that um, with Jason, and he can share it with everyone. But it's the call center number. Eventually, it'll get to who it needs to get to. All right. Uh, what exactly does significant mean? Referencing the slide that talked about significant outbreak among youth sports. Ooh, let me let me jump back in the slides. Hold on one sec, guys. Um, I'm sorry. I'm I'm really trying to jump through the slides to see where I mentioned that. Um, you know. I don't know what I was referencing there as I look through the slides. Um, if the person who asked that question can clarify in the bottom of the chat, we, we can um, we can try to get it at the end. I'm sorry. OK, no worries. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Who exactly should uh, do the reporting, the head of the league, the coach of the team or the parent of the kids? Definitely not that. I, well, <laughs> I don't want to say definitely in all circumstances. The what we have found successful and and I don't know if you guys want to reach out to your colleagues there is is centralizing a process with your league where coaches know um, a coach can submit these or a league can, can, can submit these a league kind of like a representative, a centralized person. I think having a centralized person make sure things are answered um, appropriately is the best practice, though, and make sure things are submitted appropriately. Um, so so that might include hand holding that coach. If you want the coach to submit it, that's fine. Or all the information is transferred to a centralized person who does that. It's up to you guys to decide. We have found we have heard success stories, though, with centralizing the process as much as possible. Um, we submitted surveys for all COVID cases last winter. Um, neither the submitter. Uh, yeah, I think we touched on that one, um, getting the callbacks. Uh, did I miss uh, what are the triggers of a quarantine? Yep. So, so quarantine again. If you're fully vaccinated and asymptomatic, you will not be quarantined. If you are, the trigger for a quarantine is the health department would consider you exposed to an infectious confirmed COVID case. 
and those exposure definitions, I, they were on one of the slides here. I think I clarified it a couple of times, so I don't want to belabor the point, but the slides clearly say who is considered exposed to COVID. All right. Uh, next one is if players live outside of Fairfax County, are we still coordinating with Fairfax Health Department or with their county? So very good question, Lisa. Um, I think it's probably best if you report it to our health department. Um, that other health department will be doing that investigation. Um, so we will transfer that. But again, I think it's just speed of getting things done. Usually when we, so say we prompted Prince William County to do an investigation, that might trigger them to do it a little faster. So I think duplicative reporting is fine. We're going to make sure we only do one investigation for it. Um, and if you tell us that someone is not from Fairfax, we're going to prompt our pro partners in other health departments to try to do that investigation as quickly as possible. Okay, there is a couple about the masks that looks like yep. Mark clarified. Uh, vaccinations for VHSL participants, um, that was confirmed starting in November, I believe. Um, currently no social distancing requirements. Um, are there social, are there distancing requirements for spectators? Uh, it says currently no distancing requirements. Is that that's not correct, right? Yeah, I, I don't. I will have to let John or Bill answer that, but I don't think in FCPS there's an actual requirement for distancing for spectators. Okay. I think like anything else, I think you want to use your judgment and try to limit the amount of people that are at games within your own programs. But there's no like you can't. You know, you obviously want families together. Right. It's better than having everybody <laughs> sitting together. But I don't yeah, think there's and any. I think more Mark brings up a really good point there. You know, I think the I, you, we don't we don't care about a family sitting together in, in the stands, you know, close to each other that they've been together the whole time. They're going to expose each other if, if one of them has COVID through other means. I think it's family units, household units trying to tr push that that um, distancing as much as possible, especially in indoor settings. And then we have a vaccination question about um, will middle school and high school players in community leagues need to prove vaccination? And what about elementary school players under 12 that aren't vaccinated? No, I mean, we're not required. The health department is not requiring leagues to prove vaccination status at all. I, I, I mean, I will have, I will say, you know, fairly strongly that vaccinations are going to be very, very beneficial for <laughs> getting your your players back as quickly as possible. Uh, Bill, I see you have your hand raised. Bill Kern. I can just provide a little clarity maybe on the vaccination question. We are, <clears throat> we're requiring it. In fair fact, it's not a Virginia High School League rule. I want to make sure I emphasize that. This is not a statewide Virginia High School League rule that all VHSL participants have to be vaccinated. This is a Fairfax County rule. Loudoun has since, announced, has since announced that. We were the first in the state to announce it, but since then several school divisions have followed suit. And so many school divisions across the Commonwealth are are going to follow the same requirement of their athletes, but it only applies to our programs, the Fairfax County Public School um, VHSL athletic programs. Um, there are some FAQs that, well, there, there's a long list of FAQs that are in development that will be released tomorrow talking about things like religious and medical exemptions, 15 and under, things like that. So um, just again, just making it clear that that is an FCPS requirement, not a VHSL requirement, um, and doesn't go beyond that that scope. Hopefully, that can clear up a little bit of confusion. And then, Mark, did you want to talk, touch on like NCS? There's no requirement for our on our end coming or anything, right? Um, no, that is that is okay. correct. Right now, we're we are following exactly what FCPS does. Um, and that's our guidance at this point, because those are the facilities that we are using. OK. Uh, well, the chat, the, the questions in the chat, we will provide uh, an attachment when we send out the presentation. There will be the Q&A. Um, one signature per the contract. Yes, we just need one signature from a representative from that group. Um, the Virginia Health Department of Health will be doing the investigations if there is an outbreak. Will the leagues be informed when that individuals have been vaccinated? So what we do is we we, um, so we we're dealing obviously with privacy issues and health issues here. So we want to be as careful as possible. Um, the Virginia Department of Fairfax County Health Department were almost interchangeable. Obviously, there we we act for the Virginia Department of Health um, in, in regards to contact investigations. Um, what we do is we will provide every single person who is cleared clearance letters. So that would be your if. If you if you want to 
you know, have a process where you collect clearance letters for individuals who are paused, you can do that. Um, we're telling individuals who are cleared, you can go back to your normal activities and we can provide you documentation so you can prove that if we need to. Um, I don't know how many leagues have done that. Um, usually they just take the word for individuals who are cleared, but that is a step you could do if you wanted to. Uh, if we pause awaiting outcome of, of investigation, how do we know we can resume? Um, like I said, optimally, the, we will we will come back to you and let you know um, exactly um, who you know when when we are done with our investigation. Um, I think you're going to get a sense of it when players are going to start pinging you and say, "I've been cleared by the health department." You know, once you get enough players cleared by the health department, you can you can start you can resume your activities for that. Um, you know, if people haven't heard from the health department, though, um, I think they should be waiting for a call from the health department. OK, I just saw uh, Dave Venergren. You have your hand up. I do. Hey, we ran uh, FCYBL last year relatively successfully. We played with masks. Um, if you were doing an investigation on a team that played and there was an outbreak on one team and we were wearing masks, uh, would that differ on your in your determination of you know who was shut down versus if we were not wearing masks? It's a walk great question. The, yeah, yeah, walk me through the yeah, Dave, it's a great question. Unfortunately, from <laughs> we the public health guidance we've get, we, we we just follow you know what CDC and Virginia Department of Health recommend. Um, masks play no part in determining who is exposed and who is not exposed, except in classroom settings. That is the only time that we consider masks. We get we differentiate masks with with that distance marker. So regardless of not if individuals are wearing a mask, we're still going to do our six feet, 15 minute exposure definition um, for for exposures. That's that's how it's been laid out by the Centers for Disease Control in regards to recommendations. That That's not a, you know, I, I think a lot of people say that and listen to that and go, well, why wear masks? And I think the, the point of masks is they do the, tr they are effective tools in our toolkit to limit the disease transmission. So if you want less cases in your league, um, masks are a very good way to go. And it looks like there's another hand raise, uh, EY. Can you hear me? Yep. yep. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just a couple questions. You've mainly talked about uh, sort of leagues and youth leagues. Uh, does, the, uh, does the advice that you provided or the guidance that you provided thus far and the policies does it differ at all if it's just a group of individuals um, who are using that space? So not sort of a centralized sort of coordinate coordinated thing, just like one individual convening sort of a group to essentially play pick up on a weekly basis. So that's kind of the first question. The second relies sort of within that context on, you know, decision to pause versus resume. It, it, I'm, I'm a little unclear is is the decision made by the group itself um, after they're notified by notified by the county that there's an investigation underway? Is that recommended? Um, and then to resume, is that sort of based on a recommendation or is that just the group that's making a decision based off of what they've heard from members in their party? Good, good question, UI. So the 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 first one is is fairly straightforward. So just a group of individuals are getting together and playing basketball. Um, there is no, they're going to get, if there's a positive case amongst that group, how reporting generally works is you go to a doctor, you get tested, the doctor reports it to us. So we're going to do a contact investigation for that individual. There's no governing body or league, obviously, over them. So there's no legal reporting requirement for any league there. Um, we're going to find out it because individual cases need to be reported to us. So we're going to do the investigation through that lens and we'll identify contacts, all the playing partners in that league through that lens. The second question is, is about the pause. So the pause, um, when, when we, the health department, um, find out when you report a case to us, we recommend that you pause your sport so we can do our investigation. Again, the, the recommendation there is you stop practices, you stop games, just so we can finish our investigation so that we know who um, who should be quarantined and who shouldn't be quarantined. You want, that's the reasoning for that. That changes a little bit in the world of vaccine though. If you are confident that most of the people on the team are fully vaccinated, 
then that recommendation changes a little bit. I know I'm being a little wishy-washy here, but then then you then you're fairly confident that everyone is protected. And as long as we have asymptomatic people playing, the vaccinated people can return immediately. That's where it gets a little gray area though right now in the world of vaccines. So although it's a recommendation, we understand that leagues may have some discretion to say, well, no, we checked on vaccinate, you know, we went out, we went on the limb and we checked vaccination records for all our players just so we could resume as quickly as possible. And with that information, then 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 you might be right in the decision not to pause your sport while we're doing the investigation. If you do decide to pause your sport, the health department will be the responsible party for circling back to you to say, hey, the the soccer team outbreak, the investigation is done. You guys can continue. We've told everyone who needs to be doing something. We told them all to do something. I hope that's clear now. Yeah, so just to clarify, so you're saying if it's a group of individuals, we can rely, as opposed to using this yeah. form as a mechanism, let, let more, me, we can rely on that person going to their doctor and then let, letting us know. Yeah, yep. Let, let me, I want to jump in there, Sean, just because all of you are going to get the same form. And that form, as you are having a, a, a permit for a gym, is going to require you to, to sign it and say, look, if if we're not playing, we're going to be in masks. And if a case breaks out, we're going to report it. Because because this is the first time we're allowing adults back in the gym. So our rules for the adults are going to be the same as they are for the youth group. So we do want you to report it because, and I think Sean will agree with this, it will get quicker to them than all of a sudden you waiting and then all of a sudden it's five days later and who knows who's been exposed. So. By signing that form, we're asking you to do the same thing. So, and we can get some clarification on that if it's not clear enough and come out with something else. Yeah, yeah. My, I, I thought the scenario was just people going to a Y and doing pen no, pickup. No, this, this, I think what they're talking about, they're actually having a permit. Organized. So by having a permit, they, they've decided we've got the gym from usually from nine o'clock to 1015. We're saying this is what we're going to do, and we're going to follow these rules and regulations. EY, I hope that uh, um, makes it clear for for all, for for any pickup group at night, for anybody. You have a permit, you're going to follow those same rules and regulations that we have for everybody that has a permit. Yeah, that, that, okay, that that's more, clear. More exactly right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. No, that's clear. Um, and and just to again confirm that that the group can decide whether to, you know, pause or not based on the recommendations and sort of the vaccination status of their group um, and resume as well based on those factors. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Now, now, now the thing, if, if we don't, you know, I think it, a lot of that comes down to though, we're going to really push for that pause. If you guys are not tell, you know, if, if the leagues aren't working with us to tell us, who are the players and all the contact information. I think, you know, that's the other side of the coin. We, you know, when we extend our trust to you guys, you guys have to be, you guys really need to be telling us all the information and getting back to us as quickly as possible on that. All right. Thank you. Yeah, pick up the questions again. There was, um, so if uh, you cannot guarantee circling back, then the team is paused for 14 days if the health department doesn't follow up. So I, I think what will happen in a in a in an in an optimal scenario, we're gonna we're gonna circle back with you guys. In a in a non-optimal scenario, you guys are gonna circle back with us in a in a, a few days and say what's going on, and then it's gonna trigger us to to let you know. Um, you know, it's almost like the you know you guys are are prompting us to to do what we 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 didn't have time to do, but we should be doing. I mean, I can't make promises on on how quick these things are. We are we are fairly backed up right now. We're trying to get through these as quickly as possible. I think when case counts are low, you see that turnaround really quick. When case counts are high, um, it's it's we're trying to do it as quickly as possible. But I would say that um, you're going to get a good sense. Um, the 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 question the comment is from CEO. Um, you're going to get a good sense of of where we are in our investigation by by individuals really reaching out to you say, I'm cleared, let's go back, let's go back to practice. So I think you're gonna get a good proxy from that once you have a, a, a significant proportion of a team that's saying, let's get back to practice. Okay. 
any instance of mandatory vaccination so we can let players know? Not at this point. Uh, would it be helpful to keep an attendance sheet for each adult basketball game? Um, it, we're not recommending it, but it, it, if it, it would help our investigation if if people are sitting next to each other who they don't know. To be honest, it's you know it's it's not typical practice. If you guys wanted to do it, you could. Um, it, it's I I think the the feasibility of you finding out about a spectator who's a case um, and then reporting it to us that that might not happen. So it might just not be optimal for you to collect information because you won't know a lot of times about spectators who become cases. Okay. To confirm if there's only uh, one case on a team, no requirement to report. Um, th there is no legal requirement to report. We are strongly recommending it. And, and I do want to jump back to that question. It looks like an attendance sheet for adult basketball games. Yes, yes, you would want to keep track of individuals who are playing in basketball games. Individuals playing, not the spectators themselves. I'm sorry, I misread that. Um, it looks like there's a application question. We'll, we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, yeah. Are there any limits on spectators in the gym? Uh, not no. currently. Do you know what vaccination rate among FCPS students eligible for a vaccine? I know the age group. Um, I think the last data I saw, it was very high. It was, and this is approximate, so I'm sorry you can't quote. It was almost 80% though amongst our eligible students were vaccinated. So a very high vaccination rate. If majority of participants are not vaccinated, will players be required to mask during activity? I think that's been answered. Yep. Um, do we still need to enforce the 15 minute gap between games and practices? No, that's not at this point. Practice. No. Are we still limited to one team per gym for practices? That's yeah. no longer in effect as well. No, and I would just say maintain distance between those two teams as much as possible. Okay. And then there was clarification about the Fairfax FCPS vaccine. Yep. Uh, sorry, just scrolling through. Are leagues allowed to ask for vaccination status? Yeah, I, I mean, I think your tricky thing here is you can ask. I think it's going to be you, you requiring to get vaccination status. That's a tricky one for you, right? Obviously, then you're jumping into legal grounds. I think people can, if you phrased it, we're asking so that we can just ascertain it's voluntary for you to, uh, you know, provide it. We're just trying to get a sense so that we can tailor our our recommendations and our guidance moving forward. If, if it's voluntary, of course you can, and 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 I hope your your parents wouldn't find fault in that, and your your players wouldn't find fault in that. Um, requiring it that you probably want to consult with lawyers and things like that. Okay. And there is one more about um, response on investigation. If we pause our sport, how long does it take to get a response on the investigation? I think we've been over that. Yeah. Um, the phone number, um, Sean, you're going to get that, and we'll, it'll get sent out with the PowerPoint and everything. When, yep. Um, will our league be informed if a COVID positive individual has not reported to us, but the FC, but the health department has quarantined the player? No, we we we'll, we will quarantine the player. But we're not reaching out to, so we're not reaching out to everyone's workplace or or um, schools or, or you know everything. We're not. We are identifying the person and quarantining the person. We're trying to. We're hoping that that individual listens to us. If we find out that the person is not listening to us, then we can do things like legal quarantine orders on individuals. All okay. right. Looks wow. like that's uh, all of them. And again, we'll we'll um, copy and paste these and send the questions and answers out along with the PowerPoint presentation. So you guys will have and, an opportunity to read over them. And Jason, this will also, the, the meeting will actually be posted. Is that correct? Yes, it's being recorded. So a uh, recording, if you want to send it to any of your players or, or anything like that, it'll be posted and we'll send a link to that as well. Okay, before we go, just want to make to remind everybody and for uh, that um, to apply for the active and thriving community grant opportunity for sports organizations. I know Jason sent out another email today. Please make sure uh, that you take a look at that. There's some grant money available to sports organizations. Um, Chris Scales, you want to uh, jump yeah, in I here? Just, yeah, I just wanted to touch on the um, the phone call versus the uh, red cap, and I just really want to emphasize that the red cap is the is the way to go on this just for purely keeping it organized and the ability to track cases properly so um our preference is really you do not use but it, um, if, it, if it absolutely that's the only way you can get in red caps not working or something like that and we need the information that's fine but please do uh utilize uh, case reporting through the red cap 
Yeah, and, and and just to tag on what Chris is saying there, the phone number, you're going to call someone and the person's just going to tell you you need to submit this online, honestly. That's that's how we're collecting, intaking this information. So it's going to be the same exact thing. You know, It's just a longer process for you to get to the point where you're going to have to submit that information electronically to us. Um, and, and just to wrap up, um, we will be sending out, uh, tomorrow we'll be sending out um, the form, it's, I think it's one page in it, Jason. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a one page form where you'll see the mask requirement and then the, the red cap information on there. Yeah, it's just uh, two bullet items, the masking and the link with uh, the red cap reporting and everything. Yeah, um, so we'll make sure we get that information out and we're gonna, we're gonna ask you to please turn that around as quickly as possible as we know the gyms start um, Monday. I believe um, so we're trying to get that information back around. We know we're late, but we wanted to wait to do this meeting because we knew things could change. And you know this, what we're talking about today may not be around tomorrow. So we're trying to uh, try to get the information out to you as as urgently as we could and in a timely manner as we could. So please try to get those turned around as quickly as possible. Um, yeah. Sean, any final words from you? Yeah, I saw a really good question I do want to address, and, and then I, I will jump off. I know I've taken up too much of, of everyone's time on a, a Tuesday night. Um, we have started a process with our school systems to try to clear vaccinated asymptomatic individuals as quickly as possible. We are planning and we hope to expand that to everyone who is exposed, so including sports leagues. Um, we're trying to work out the kinks right now to make sure it, it is it is functional. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks that can be rolled out to all sports leagues. So then obviously there'll be some more communication, but it'd be simply your players would be submitting information on an online survey to our league and we clear them as quickly as possible. So we're hoping to expand that soon. All right. Um, well, first of all, again, thank everybody for joining us. Sean, thank you so much. I know you guys are uh, um, knowing you, you probably have to go back to work. Um, so I really appreciate, or you haven't left work yet. So I appreciate you taking the time to answer these questions and to provide information that is critical for the safety of our students, for our athletes, for the parent, for everybody involved. That's what we want. We want everybody to be safe and still be able to participate. If you have any additional questions, please don't hesitate to contact us um, at NCS and we can run them to Sean if need be. and and. So we hope this was helpful. We'll get that uh, sheet out to you tomorrow. And please, again, if for organizations, if you haven't, um, uh, take a look at that uh, grant proposal. Jason sent it out today. If you have questions about that, let us know. Um, thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks all.